Okay, I'm ready. It's recording. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we finish our study in Judges 12 and progress into Judges 13, let us praise the Lord for his guidance, for his blessings, and for all that he is showing us in the studies of these chapters. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you have been providing in these studies and through these days. Help us, Father, that our heads may be clear, that we may be able to understand the symbols that are placed before us. Direct us now as we join together. We thank you for the blessing that you have offered in your promise that where two or more are gathered, there you will be also. We know now, as we have known, of our great need of your spirit and of your angels to attend us. Help us so that what we study today may help us to understand that which you would have us to do. I thank you for each person that is attending today. Help us each one that we may be able to, to participate and contribute in that that you would have us to understand. Be with us now, for this we ask, for this we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Now, in Judges 12. So after our situation with Jephthah, we had Ibzan, a Bethlehem, and then we had Elon, a Zeblonite. And then after Elon, we had Abdon, the son of Hillel, a Pirithonite of Ephraim. What else do we need to examine of these judges? Well, well, the first thing is we noted there's three of these. Correct. So representing the first, second, and third angel's messages is the suggestion. We also have numbers associated with them. Um, of course, we can see the, um, the seven, the ten, and the eight, which would be a symbol of July 18th. Correct. Right. Correct. And, and then we have... Um, these 30 sons and 30 daughters plus the additional uh, 30 daughters or, um, that are brought. Right. Daughters are sent out. So there's this exchange of daughters sent out and daughter-in-laws uh, uh, brought in. So what would that have to do with the first angel's message, I guess, is part of the question. Um well, we could say one thing is that 30 years are attached to uh, the beginning of the first angel's message in our history with the time of the end. Okay. Right, so 30 years going to November 9th, 2019. And then, um, and then in the last one, we have the 40 sons and 30 nephews and the, the 70 uh, ass cults. Right. So we have the symbol of, of the 70 divided as 40 and 30. And we know the, the four and the three is something that shows up in prophecy, um, like the four churches and then the three churches or the four trumpets and then the last three trumpets. And, and always this sort of distinction, even in the last three, is sort of a division um, of two and one. Um, so... So we have we have th structures here that that relate to to prophecy, um, and then of course we dealt a little bit with the meaning of these names and where they're from, and tried to figure out the the symbolism there. Um, with the Zebulonite, I had looked at Zebulun with the uh, period of time from. Uh, the founding of the church to July 18th is the number of the tribes of Zebulun in days. 
So I, I can't remember the other things that we had looked at. I believe we were just beginning to look at that yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, we were. We, we had just touched on, on, on the numbering of the tribes. So that's from May 23rd, uh, 1863 to July 18, 2020 was whatever it is, 57,400 days or something, or 54,700, I can't remember. Um, yeah, so 57,400 days. Now, in, in relating this then to, to our time, because I think what we would have to do is take this as the three angels' messages in our time, in the repeat of history. How would we relate all of these symbols? We have the July 18, 2020 symbol with just the years of these different uh, judges, plus we have the Zebulun uh, number, the 57,400 tying us to um, the Adventist Church beginning and July 18th. So that's another symbol for July 18th. Okay. Um, and I could also say, you know, the 40 and the 30 being the four and the three, dealing with the trumpets. I mean, it is from the trumpets that we did uh, established July 18th, 2020, right, dealing with the woes. And of course, we have the Askels, so that's going to symbolize Islam. Okay, now, in this situation with these three judges, we have... Abdon judging Israel for eight years. We have Elon judging for 10. And we have Ibsen judging for seven. Now, in reference to Stephen's study on tabled history and this in this part of the judges. Would we look at these as being consecutive judges or concurrent judges? Well, they say after him. Now, um, so after him and then after him and then after him, right? So it would be consecutive, not concurrent. If we, I'm just, I'm looking at the Hebrew. Yeah, so that word is the word that would mean after. So it's it's not ambiguous in any way. And of course they show the person died and then after him and uh, then Elon the Zebulonite died, right? He's buried and then after him Abdon. So so it should be consecutive okay and there's a there's a reason i asked the question in this manner mm -hmm. so and that that's going to become very clear as we get into judges <clears throat> 13. okay well this is 25 years right um which is the number of days between midnight and the midnight cry as well right so on that And we had marked, you know, midnight being November 9th, 2019, and midnight cry being July 18, 2020. Okay. So again, it connects us to July 18. Now, it doesn't give us lots of information here, though. So the question is, because we know that in Judges we have these 
uh, these oppressions that are occurring and then you're going to have a judge who is going to represent a message and that is he's going against a message which is an oppressive message it's error and and then he has truth that stands against it but here with this last part we don't we don't really have any particular enemy being named we just have the list of these three judges so the only thing um, that I, what's that Stephen you have some thoughts yeah just another yeah I have another thought concerning the calculation yeah uh, seven seven times eight is 56 mm -hmm. and then 56 times 10 is 560 yeah and uh, from the if you go to the siege of Jerusalem in the time of Ezekiel mm -hmm. it begins on the 10th day of the 10th month in the ninth year of Zedekiah and it's 560 days until the ninth day of the fourth month when the siege actually ends okay so it's the number of days of the siege in, in literal time or symbolically a uh, literal time okay literal time so so 560 literal days for the siege itself okay and, and that's interesting now the siege as a symbol is being discussed uh by colin um and what is the significance there what is the siege about in, in our history well we could maybe connect it to the pandemic right and the so lockdowns we, and then that starts in 2019 even though yes. uh, the lockdowns don't start then and and i had marked the 10th day of the 10th month in uh on our calendar that is uh, the 10th day of the 10th month is october 10th uh 2019 and it was on october 10th uh that i discovered uh the connection of the mayan calendar uh, uh it's a long story but dealing with how it was connected to july 18th um so that was a whole study dealing with uh um the 144,000 back to day back tune and how it was related to uh, the 142,810 day period of the 391 years. So it's kind of a, a long involved study, but that was discovered on October 10th and I'd already predicted October 10th uh, using another study. And then the date that it actually produced was October 11th, the next day. Um, so it was rather interesting. October 11th was a Friday. Um, so, but the point is this siege was, was marking something that was happening in 2019. So there's something happening in this movement and understanding, and there's something that ha is happening in the world that is witnessing to that. But the siege primarily uh, for this movement, what is the significance of the siege? Because what's the significance of the siege for Ezekiel? What what well, is going to lead to this? The destruction of the, the temple and the captivity, whatever of uh, Zedekiah. Right. Uh, it was going to be. You can connect it to the fall of the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Right. So you're going to have like, so he's going to have this, this 390 years and these 40 years as a symbol, right? And we know that he's going to begin on the fifth day of the fourth month, midnight, and he's going to be completed on uh, August 15th, the date of the midnight cry, right? So he symbolizes midnight to the midnight cry. In his prediction of the siege,
So what would be the significance of that um, if we understand Ezekiel, what he's doing? Because ultimately he is predicting July 18, 2020, right? Just as Revelation 9 is. So what does that tell us yes. about yeah, so what does that tell us about the pandemic and, and July 18, 2020? Well, that was uh, the premise of Adelio's study. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That connected uh, the pandemic to July 18 mm -hmm. with all the, the vaccine mandates and uh, patient mm -hmm. zero and so forth. Yeah. And, and so that's extremely significant. So Adilio's study and Colin's study are tying together July 18 to what's happening externally, showing that what's happening externally was a fulfillment of prophecy. So both the pandemic, which is something that Jeff talked about first in on January 14th, um, 2017, and, and prior to that, we already had the Trump prediction, right? So we had Trump had become elected. And so Trump was still tied in with this. So we got the Trump and the pandemic. The question is, have those been fulfilled in connection with July 18? And how would Judges, the, these, this a passage from Judges 12, verse 8 to 15, how would that relate? Because we have all these symbols of July 18th. We have the symbol of Islam. We have some other symbols as well. Well, there's a, a typology in the sense it's a, a type of what's coming up. Okay. Yeah, so this is giving us all the symbols of this movement, showing that it's the first, second, and third angels' messages. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, does anybody have any thoughts about the last verse, uh, Judges 12, 15? Uh, where he's buried at Pit Pirithon in the land of Ephraim in the Mount of the Amalekites. What would be the significance of that? I was going to question that. Yeah. Because to be buried in the Mount of the Amalekites, I mean, that's, that's a bit strange. Mm-hmm. And we don't see much about this this area where he is buried anywhere else in the Bible either. Yeah, I don't see any references to anything. Um, buried in enemy territory. That's what it says in the chat. Um, yeah. Or is that implied? I mean, the Pirithon Pirith is mentioned, of course, as we've talked about. Um, so Pirithon is in the land of Ephraim, in the Mount of the Amalekites. But specifically what that's referring to is not really certain. Well, I was looking at this because as, as we are aware, Jephthah is of the tribe of Manasseh, right? Yeah. Elon buried 
excuse me, not, but abdomen, abdomen. Yeah. buried in Ephraim. Would that make him an Ephraimite? What well, seems to be the case, it just, I, I would think that's because where he was from, he's a Pirithonite and Pirithon so in the land of Ephraim. So he's an Ephraimite. So the other two judges that we're talking about came from Zebulun. And we know this, this Bethlehem, as we were addressing this, of Ibsen, was not Bethlehem that we find later in Judah. It's a different Bethlehem altogether. Right, up by Asher and Naphtali and uh, right. kind of in that area. And Dan. So I'm asking... I'm having to ask myself, is it possible that Jephthah and Abdon are kind of bookends to show that both of these judges were of the inheritance of Joseph? Okay. Um... Okay, so let's say that this represents our history from 1989 to some point either presently or in the future. Okay. The proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. Um, so... Um, and, and just a couple of things here. So we know that in Judges 10, just dealing with uh, um, because we have these symbol here, just going back to the first one, you have the 30 sons and the 30 daughters, right? And then with Abdon, he has 40 sons and 30 nephews, and they ride on these 70 uh, ass colts. And remember back in Judges 10, um, uh, th this is the story of Tola and J.R., where J.R. had um, 30 sons that were on 30 ass cults, and they had 30 cities. So we have this same symbolism here, the 30, the 30, the 30, that we have in um, Judges chapter 12 at the end. So would that tie that first angel's message together with that other symbol? And and I think I'd have to consider that, but I mean this this situation is going to take some fairly direct consideration overall. Yeah, I, I just you know, I mean, we've been going through judges for quite a while. Uh, I think we started in March or something. You said May. May? Was it May? Okay, yeah. so in May. And um, so we, we keep having this these reoccurring symbols and patterns. We haven't laid them all down on top of each other yet. Um, and, of course, Judges 12 is followed by Judges 13. Um, which means that there's, at least I believe that there's something here about this section that's almost like a preamble to Judges 13. Um, I'm not, not necessarily that, it, well, this is kind of summing up something, and Judges 13 is kind of going to give us some detail about something. Uh, that we haven't looked at yet because we haven't looked at Judges 13. Uh, but the story of, of Samson is, uh, it's, it's basically the last of, of, of these stories. And then we're going to go and f go back to, in Chapter 17, we're going to go back to the beginning of the period of the Judges. So the question is, what does Samson represent and why does we have just before samson why do we have these three 
minor judges mentioned. And, and I think this is something that's meant to help us um, in our understanding of, of the story of Samson. Because this is, well, maybe preamble isn't the right, but it's, it's a review, uh, a summary of, of our history. The first, second, and third angel's message. Of course, it's pointing to the third, which is, is going to be the Sunday law. And, and the question is, does Samson address the Sunday law? Or does Samson address just elements of elements. the third angel's message? Okay, elements of the third angel's message, yeah. There's, there's a bunch in, in the story of Samson that we've missed, but we will see more than we ever have because of how we've gone through the first part of Judges. Right. Okay, so. uh, I noticed that Adhan means servant and Hillel, one of the meanings is praise, so that's pretty positive. Yeah. Okay, what else? I mean, as we finish Judges 12, 15, the translators gave reference back about this with the land of the Amalekites to Judges 3.13, 3.27, and 5.14. Judges 3.13, and he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. Which is Jericho. Right. And it came to pass when he was come that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim and the children of Israel went down with him from the mount and he before them. And then we are to combine that with Judges 5.14. Out of Ephraim there was a root of them against Amalek after thee Benjamin among thy people out of Mount Machir came down governors and out of Zebulun they that handle the pen of the writer. Mm -hmm. And that being part of the song of Deborah. Yeah. And, and we have then um, this, uh, the Amalekites here. Right. Course, that's the, the main point, I think, is that this ties us back to the story of the Amalekites in the land of Ephraim. Okay. Any other thoughts or considerations in this area? Yeah. Well, just the thing that in, when we had dealt with uh, chapter three of Judges, that was the first one where we started lining up these nations that were left to test or prove Israel. And. Okay. So, so you can see how um, when you deal with um, you know, Zothniel, Ehud, and uh, Shamgar, right? And then you're going to get the story of Deborah and Barak, which is why you're going to have the song of Deborah in chapter 5 of Judges. And so, so we had put those on a line and showed how this is this progression. So now when we get to the end of this, to Judges 12, Judges 12 sort of sums up the history of this movement, um, bringing us to the message of righteousness by faith, the third angel's message, and its proclamation. Uh, because we have abdon, which is, uh, which means servile. He's like a, that means like a servant or someone who serves, servitude. And but he's the son of praise. And um, 
We don't have really much about Pirathon, what it means. Um, it's just a place. But he's a Pirathonite. He dies and is buried in Pirathon, in the land of Ephraim, in the Mount of the Amalekites. So, was it Andrew said, like in the land of the enemy? Something like that. Enemy territory. Yeah. So I, I think it's giving us this, this summary, but looking ahead to, to the story of Samson. So it covers the history from 1989 to the Sunday Law, I guess is the point I'm making. I, I was... Excuse me, I was just thinking that maybe Abdon was like those who at first pursued the truth and then proclaimed it and then backslid and reneged on it because he was buried in the land of the enemy. Well, just so. Yeah. yeah, except that this to me is more like conquering them because the enemy has been conquered. So, okay. Right. Um, so this is the conquering of the enemy is the way that I look at it. Uh, the victory of righteousness by faith. So anything else about chapter 12 before we go to chapter 13, Dwight? I haven't really seen anything else. Okay. I mean, we've covered the questions that, that I had and laid it out for further consideration but at this point we're at a point to be able to turn the page to go into the next chapter mm -hmm. oh uh, pirathon can mean princely okay where that do you get that from uh i get it from uh the word pirathon a Hebrew 6552. Okay. Brown driver's brakes. It's just, uh, yeah, so that's the, the word that means princely. You don't get that in Strong's. And, and of course, that would then fit in uh, um, with Abdon being the servant of praise, and he's buried in princely, right? The city of, that's princely. In the land of Ephraim in the Mount of the Amalekites. So this is the victory over sin, victory over the mark of the beast. Now, did we ever determine what the 40 sons and the 30 sons' sons or the 30 nephews had represented? Well, the way that I looked at that, it was having to do with the trumpets, the four and the three. Okay. Right, and and we have that, that grouping also with... Um, the four, the seven churches, four and three, uh, seven seals, and the seven trumpets, and, and it shows up in other places too. Four and three. Why would the alternate Hebrew instead of nephews regard this as sons' sons? Well, because that's literally how you spell, how you say nephews in Hebrew. So it just uses sons' sons. Yeah. So, um, and. In, in Hebrew, it's uh, it's just beni, benin, right? So sons, sons, uh, but but plural. So the son, son, sons. But, okay, but is that not a doubling? Yeah, it's a doubling. So how do the forty and the thirty relate then if the Sons, sons is a doubling, which we've accepted as the second angel's message. How do we then relate the 40? Well, you can relate it to the first angel's message and the second angel's message. Okay. And, and one of the ways you do that is when you go from, you take our main way, Mars. Uh, you're going to go, um, the first angel arrives, the first angel is formalized, the first angel is empowered. And then the second angel arrives. But when the second angel arrives, 
it's also marking a close of probation for the first angel's message. Correct? Okay. And so that's going to be four way marks from the giving of the message to the close. And then you're going to have the three, midnight, midnight cry, the Sunday law, because we have seven way marks, right? All right. If we divide them, we could, you know, we could divide them as three, three, and one. Uh, but you can also divide them as four and three. Okay. Right. So, so that's the way I would look at it relating to, uh, to the reform line. Does that that help? That helps a little bit. Okay. Okay. Now, as we go into Judges 13, we have a notation by the translators that Israel serveth the Philistines 40 years. Then we have the angel that appears to Manoah's wife, who is barren, and telleth her that she shall bear a son. She informs her husband of this. At Manoah's prayer, the angel appeareth to him and instructeth him what they must do. Then we have Manoah's sacrifice, whereby the angel is discovered. And in the final section, we have Samson being born. So here we have this. Judges 13, 1. So 13, 1. 13, the 13th day of the first month as a symbol. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. So we would have to look at this as being a time period where the Philistines have command over the promised land of Israel. Now, getting back to the, the question that I asked before, when we add up the prior three judges, if we take those consecutively, we have a period of 25 years, right? Yeah. Now, Mrs. White writes the following. Notwithstanding all that God had wrought for his people in the wilderness, the children of Israel, after their settlement in Canaan, continued to walk in their own ways. They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled unto the heathen and learned their works. Yeah, among they, the heathen. What? You said unto, yeah, among the heathen. Mingled among among the heathen. heathen and learned their works. And they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people insomuch that he had he abhorred his own inheritance and he gave them into the hand of the heathen and they that hated them ruled over them. <clears throat> when Israel was sorely harassed by the children of Ammon on the east and the Philistines on the west, the Lord hearkened to the prayers of his people and began to work for their deliverance. After 18 years of oppression, they made war against the Ammonites and effectually destroyed their power. But the backsliding and idolatrous people soon forgot the lesson that divine wisdom had so often sought to teach them. As they continued to depart from God, he permitted them still to be oppressed by their powerful enemies, the Philistines. For 40 years, the children of Israel were constantly harassed and at times completely subjugated by this cruel and warlike nation. They had mingled with these idolaters, uniting with them in commerce, 
in pleasure, even in worship, until they seem to be identified with them in spirit and in interest. Then these professed friends became their bitterest enemies and sought by every means to accomplish their destruction. There were still in Israel true-hearted men and women whose souls were filled with anguish because of the condition of the people. Their prayers of confession, penitence, and faith ascended without ceasing to God. He was not indifferent to their cries, and while there was apparently no response to them, he was preparing help for them. In all Israel, there was not to be found a man through whom the Lord could work for the, for, for the deliverance of his people. The erroneous education given to children, indulgence of appetite, and conformity to the practices of heathenism had greatly lessened physical and moral power. Now, all of this is Signs of the Times, February 26th, 1902. So, we have this 25 years noted before where we have three judges. But Mrs. White's also noting a period of 18 years, oppression by the Ammonites, followed by a 40-year oppression by the Philistines. Correct? Okay, yeah, so, so the 18 years that she's referring to here, wouldn't be, this be the 18 years of Judges 10? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I'm, I believe that's part of the question, yes. Yeah, so it's the 18 years of Judges 10, and then it's going to be followed by 40 years? Well, if, we, if we're going to say that we, this is the 18 years of Judges 10. Yeah. Then how long do we have here with Jephthah in Judges 11? Um, well, in, okay, so that's the good that's the question so yeah so so we have 18 years that they're that they're oppressed and then we take the story of jephthah as beginning at the end of those 18 years i would think so okay now it's going to be the philistines that are going to oppress them though for 40 years right correct now this is this is in Western Israel. Okay. Right. Correct. Story of Samson. Well, we have we're we're speaking at this point. Yes, that this would be Southwest. Yeah, Southwest, where the Philistines are. Um, though we have this man of Zora of the family of the Danites, so he's of the tribe of Dan. Um, Stephen, have you sort of fit this together at all? Do you remember how this fits together? I mean, the situation. Um, Go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, I had some ideas whether these here 40 years of the Philistines composed part of the 18 years of the Philistines and Ammon. But just with hearing that, uh, what uh, Dwight relayed there, it seems very much it comes afterwards. Okay, so explain explain how you how you're seeing it because I, I didn't follow the. So you have the eighteen years, yeah. and then yes, and then you would have followed. then you would have Jephthah for six years. Yeah, and then you have Elon whatever 25 years um, yes but um the way Ellen White said that it seemed to be as if that was within that period of that 40 years but 
you know, she doesn't really make mention of their of their judging. You know, it just seemed to be relating to the, the 18 years and then the 40 years. Yeah, I mean... I'm sort of try, I'm trying to wrestle with it myself. Yeah, I know. I understand. Yeah, it's not, it's not so straightforward. But you have uh, the 18 years that they're being oppressed, the six years of Jephthah, so that's going to be... Um, 24 years, right? No. 18 and 6 is 24. Oh, excuse me. I, I take the 18 as being a time of oppression. I mean, I'm going back mentally into, into Stephen's paper of tabled history because he separates clearly the time of the judges. Right. Okay, so you would have Jephthah plus the three judges that followed him being a period then of 31 years. So you'd have 18 plus 31, which would give you 49. But you're not going to give six years for Jephth Jephthah? Well, okay. The, the 18 plus six and then, then the 25 years. I was doing 18 and then taking the 6 plus the 25. Which is 31. Right. And so if we took all of that as a consecutive time frame, that's 49 years. Okay. Yeah. Now, but Samson, he's going to be a judge for 20 years. But... First, we're, we're going to note here that we have the 40 years that the children of Israel were constantly harassed. By the Philistines. Correct. Which is a different area of Israel. Correct. And we just don't know how these overlap. Correct. Because we don't, you know, the judges aren't ruling all of Israel like a king would. Right. Are. I mean, Stephen did an excellent job on that in his, in his paper. Yeah. So we just don't really know how they all fit together. Other than we can say that there are groups of things that we know are consecutive. There's other things that we're not sure how they fit with the other ones. Like where they overlap, because it doesn't give us enough information to do that. So it's hard to work out. Right. Um, so... So Stephen says the 20 years of Samson as a judge is another example of an overlap of the years given in the book of Judges. It could be understood that 20 years of Samson judged was a portion of the 40 years of the Philistine oppression, which, which is the position I take. Right? Because during that time, even though he's a judge, he doesn't really conquer the Philistines. They're still being oppressed in that period of time. And Ellen White says, yeah. it's had judged in just Israel in the day of the Philist days of the Philistines, 20 years. Right, Stephen? That's that would still be true. Yes, and then there's an Ellen White statement that uh, she says that uh, Samson began to uh, as a young man early in the period of the uh, of Philistine oppression. Yeah, yeah, I've had the statement. Yeah. Right. So it seems in this 40 years that Samson's a growing up and then he's going to be a judge for 20 of those 40 years. Okay. Yeah. So I, I take it that he's maybe like, I think as a young man, he then goes to, um, to into the Philistines to, to make up marriage. Mm-hmm. So Agree. Uh, I take it he's maybe he's maybe about seventeen, eighteen, maybe, mm -hmm. and then you're going to have twenty years. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have any. I wouldn't have any heartburn over that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just where you know many people just take all the the years that are mentioned in the judges without any consideration of location, how they're related, and they put them all consecutive to get a long period of the judges. And we know that that can't be correct. 
One is it disagrees with First Kings chapter six verse one, but um, and also Ellen White statements. So we know that these uh, you can't just add up like the twenty years that Samson judged and add it on to the forty years of Philistine oppression. So this is an example that these periods can overlap, but exactly where all of them overlap is not really clear. I mean, we don't have, for some of them, we don't really have an exact starting point or end point. I mean, I, I haven't worked on it, you know, now that we've been going through the judges in a lot more detail, I mean, it does give us a better picture of it, but I haven't put it all together to figure out how the puzzle would fit chronologically. Yeah, so, pardon me, Stephen's work was really, really helpful for us on sorting through uh, what we see here in Judges. But now we have Samson, so we know it's during this 40 years of Philistine oppression, based on the spirit of prophecy statements. Okay. Now, this final sentence in this article from Signs of the Times is going to be elaborated on in several other paragraphs as Mrs. White presents it. So again, the erroneous education given to children, indulgence of appetite and conformity to the practices of heathenism had greatly lessened physical and moral power. Is this not something that we see clearly within the world today? Mm -hmm. Now from the chat, comment was made that the 24 or 25 years or days between the midnight between midnight and the midnight cry in 1844 can also be represented by 49 years that are seven sabbatical cycles to the jubilee so no i didn't say that i said 24 and 24 for 25 days between the midnight and the midnight cry in 1844 and then the 49 years, it, I've got a spider looking at me, are seven sabbatical cycles to, to, to the Jubilee. Excuse me while I kill the spider. Yeah, well, the spider has a right to live. Not when it's crawling above my bed and just disappeared behind it. <laughs> but if we, if, added, me, I'll get it. <laughs> if okay. we look at this additively 24 plus 25, those still add to 49. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my my thought as I was looking at this is to question whether or not this could have been some type of a 49 year period. Yeah, I just don't where's the 24 days from or 24 years? That's the that's the six and the eighteen. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's the years, but when it comes to days, I mean, it is 25. I'm just paralleling because I noticed 24 or 25. And I thought July 21st to August 15th. Which is 25 days. Because there's 31 days in July. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, But yeah, the 49, so the 24 plus the 25 years uh, being the 49 years, they do symbolize the 25 years does to symbol, symbolize between midnight and the midnight cry. And you have these seven sabbatical cycles or seven weeks Pentecost if you took days. Okay. Judges 13, 2. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now it's interesting in this that the translators would tie this up from 13.3 to 
back with Judges 6.11. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the Abizarite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So we had addressed that the angel of the Lord that came to Gideon was Christ. Mm -hmm. Here again, the same phrase is being used. And as we go through this from scripture, not just scripture and spirit of prophecy, but from scripture alone, I believe the same identification can be made. Now, therefore, beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Okay, so one is we can tie this to Isaiah chapter 7. Right. Um, now, we know Isaiah chapter 7, even though the New Testament applies it to Christ, that's by using a rule of interpretation of parallelism. That right. is, the prophecy itself refers to the birth of Manasseh, and Manasseh becomes a type of Christ. So that's Isaiah 7, 14, you know, a woman shall... A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And we can show that the virgin, the virgin is Israel. It's not really referring to Mary directly, or or even directly to um, Manasseh's mother, even though her name is tied to the symbol of Israel, Hephzibah, Ahef right? So in Isaiah 20, 62, I believe it is, you have this reference to Hephzibah. Um referring to Israel. Um, so, so anyway, you have this symbol here with, with Samson. But the virgin that shall conceive and bear a son that we have in the kingship, Manasseh, being a type of Christ, uh, refers to Christ's first coming. But I, I believe that the story of Samson is referring to Christ's second coming. And the child that shall be born is the image of Christ in his people. This is, is really the third angel's message in verity. Right? Or the righteousness by faith in verity. This is the third angel's message. That is, the third angel's message shows the completion of the work of righteousness by faith that is a process that happened with the first and second angel's messages. And so this child then is Christ in his people. Okay. And, and you also have, uh, are not Seventh-day Adventists Nazarites? Technically they should be. Yeah, and, and the reason is, um, you know, we have a vow, and that's uh, uh, abstinence from alcohol. Right? That's supposed to be correct. Yeah. And and that's part of the Nazarite vow. And we also don't eat anything unclean. Right? And we are not supposed to partake of any stimulants. Right. And um, now the symbolism of the hair, so that the that is, I mean, they cut their head. And then they let their hair grow. They cut their hair and let their head, hair grow on their head. Right? Okay. And I don't know, I don't particularly know, because um, we'll see this more as we look into it, but it's just a sign or a symbol of the vow itself. Right? Correct. Okay. So there's, why, you know, why particularly hair on the head? I don't know if there's any parallel I could see to something. But it is a symbol of... An outward symbol of the vow that had been taken. Yeah, 
in Psalm 140, it talks about uh, the Lord covereth my head in the day of battle. So maybe that's referring to the Lord shielding us. The hair represents that shielding. Well, and, and, and Samson's going to say that his power lies in his hair. But it's really the symbol of his power. Is the hair itself. It's not something magical, but it was it's a symbol of his obedience to God, to his vow. <clears throat> so so this would refer to a group of people and and it's this period of 40 years. So one thing about the period of 40 years, um, this movement, um, we, we have tied to this movement the period of uh, 14,587 days, right? That's the, the falling of the manna for 40 years. Okay. And does anybody remember where we place that? I mean, we did have it from August 11th, 1980 to July 18, 2020. August 11th being my personal conversion, but also tied to um, Glacier View. And it's a symbol of the falling of the stars. So basically it's uh, the person the most impressive Perseid meteor shower that is that we have recorded, which I witnessed personally at the height of its uh, occurring. Did we have it any any other place? Fourteen thousand five hundred and eighty-seven days. Not that I recall, but I, of course, could be very wrong. But it's a, it's a period of 40 years. Uh, I thought I had it another place, but I can't find it here. Uh, I mean, it's obviously the time that the manna fell. Um, where else was it? Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, so I just have, there's some other place I had placed it. Um, uh, well, I think I connected it with um, uh, 2030, but I can't remember how I did that. But these 40 years can represent, uh, just like the 30 represents um, our movement, but there's also a 40 that represents our period of time. This is the oppression of the Sunday law. How else would we approach that?
Any other thought? Um, well, the only other thing is if I take the the number of of months. So the number of months is 394 months. 394 months, or is it no? It's 494 months. Is that what it is? Just hang on. Uh, I have to do this again. Yeah, so that ends up being um, the period of time. So if we go to uh, November 9th, 1989, and we count, which is the 10th day of the 8th month on the biblical calendar. And remember the period that the manna fell is a period of 40 years less a month. Right, because it's going to start on the 16th day of the second month in 1533, and it's going to end on the 16th day of the first month in um, 1493. So it's going to be 40 years less a month. And if we count from November 9th, 1989, that same period of time, it's going to bring us to the 10th day of the seventh month in 2029. And, and then we're going to have, uh, so if that's the start of the civil year, then you're going to have uh, the religious year following uh, six months later on April 5th, 2030. Right, and then that's also going to have uh, an ending. So that would have to be like a jubilee year or something like that for it to start on the 10th day of the seventh month. Anyway, so that's the other 40 years that I have. So that goes from November 9th, 1989 to uh, that history dealing with 2030 that we had studied. So could that be what's being referenced here in Judges chapter 13 as far as the 40 years of the Philistines? So we'd have a couple of interesting numerical symbols here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Mrs. White continues. At this time, the Lord appeared to the wife of Manoah, an Israelite of the tribe of Dan and informed her that she should have a son. And in view of this, he gave her special instruction concerning her own habits and also for the treatment of her child. Now, was she a daughter of Israel? Well, well yeah. So she was married to a member of the tribe of Dan she was an Israelite, a daughter of Israel. But many of these things are being presented to her that are as special instructions. Yeah. Now, therefore, beware, I pray thee, and drink neither wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. Wasn't it well understood by the children of Israel they were not to eat any unclean thing? Yeah. Is it not supposed to be understood by the members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church not to eat any unclean thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yet, this is something that is largely set aside by many within the church. I personally know of members 
that have no problem eating shrimp, crab, lobster, or snails. And that's including pastors. So I know one who drinks. How do, how do they get around those things as Adventists? What's the rationale? They don't offer a rationale. They just decide that this is what they're going to do. Okay. I know didn't many. They, didn't they take a vow? Well, I'm sure that they did. So if they took a vow, I mean, even if you decided the vow was, you know, foolish you would still follow that vow right you know unless you were somehow deceived into taking a vow or something um but well i don't see them being deceived in this but i've also been very aware of those that choose to drink wine and i'm speaking fermented wine and choose to drink other alcoholic beverages yeah it just destroys a person it does he also directed that no razor should come upon the head of the child for he was to be consecrated to god as a nazarite from his birth and through him the lord would begin to deliver israel from the philistines god himself appeared to the wife of manoah and told her that she should have a son and that he should be a great man and should deliver Israel. Then he gave her special instructions regarding her diet. She must not use wine or strong drink, for this would affect her offspring. Who is it that says this? It is the God of heaven. He has a right to say it, for he made man. He has a right to the affections and the whole, the entire mind of man. He has made man in his own image, and he expects that man will render to him the powers that he has imparted to him. Let us regard this as instruction given to every mother in our world. If you want your children to have well-balanced minds, you must be temperate yourselves. Keep your own heart and affection sound and healthful, that you may impart to your offspring a healthful mind and body. So is this righteousness by faith? I think it is truly the message, the right arm of the gospel of righteousness by faith. I think this is truly the health message. And it's how a person um, demonstrates faith or actively participates in faith. Correct. Yeah. So... so so the message of Samson, his, like we're saying that these Samson doesn't represent some person or anything in our movement. He represents a message, and it is the message of righteousness by faith. Exactly. In obedience to God. But it's, it's giving the entire message, including the right arm of the gospel. Yeah. But also we know that these are symbolic as well. Right. So the wine and the strong drink. Isaiah 28, or Isaiah 28, I always get those mixed up, right? Yeah. Oh, drunkards of Ephraim, you're saying? Yeah, yeah the drunkards of Ephraim, yeah. Yeah, so that's Isaiah 28. To understand what value the Lord has placed upon human beings, look to Calvary. They are of great value in the sight of God. In order to elevate man, Christ left his honor and glory in heaven and came to our earth to die. The very Christ that redeemed man by dying on his behalf gave instruction to the wife of Manoah and through that record to the people generally. That very same Jesus who so values man tells him what is for his very best and highest interest in this world then should we not seek to preserve every God-given power in the best, the very best condition to serve him? The very best that we can give to God is feeble enough. He has given us 
a habitation here, our bodies, for which we must have a special care. Why is there so much misery and suffering in the world today? It is because God, is it because God loves to see his creatures miserable? Oh, no. It is because the immoral habits of man have weakened his physical, mental, and moral powers. We mourn over Adam's transgression and seem to think that our first parents showed great weakness in yielding to temptation. But if Adam's transgression were the only evil that we had to meet, this world would be in a much better condition than it is. There has been a succession of falls since Adam's day. Now, that's, that's quite a thought to have to consider. Judges 13, 6. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me he his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. The woman sought her husband, and after describing the heavenly visitant, she repeated the message of the angel. Then, fearful that they should make some mistake in the important work committed to them, the husband prayed earnestly, let the man of God, which thou did send, come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. Now, there's a lot of other references from the, what the translators had seen. So at this point, we are now within bare moments of the end of our time for today. Mm -hmm. I think what we'll do with permission in the morning, we'll go over some of this of what the translators had seen and then progress into the next segment from Judges 13.8. Yeah, and then and go back over some of the details that we haven't looked at. Right. Yeah, okay. So is there any other comments or questions with what we're looking at today? Any other thoughts? All right, shall we then close? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this example. We thank you for these symbols. We thank you for this opportunity that we've had to study together. Direct us today, help us and guide us in that which we need to understand. Do with us today that which is necessary. May those with whom we come in contact see your character and not ours. Help us now to become fit vessels. Direct us so that we may indeed be a blessing to all those with whom we come in contact. May your will be done. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.